Hey, what's up guys? My name is Eterno and welcome back to my C++ series. So today we're gonna learn all about how the C++ compiler works. So let's take a step back and think about this for a minute. What is the big picture here? What is the C++ compiler actually responsible for? So we write our C++ code as text. It, that's all it is, it's just a text file. And then we need some way to transform that text into an actual application that our computer can run. In going from that text form to an actual executable binary, we basically have two main operations that need to happen. One of them is called compiling, and one of them is called linking. In this video, we're just gonna talk about compiling. I've actually made another video specifically covering linking, so you might wanna check that out as well. The link will be in the description below. So with that being said, the only thing that the C++ compiler actually needs to do is to take our text files and convert them into an intermediate format called an object file. Those object files can then be passed on to the linker and the linker could do all of its linky things. But anyway, we're talking about compiling here. The compiler actually does several things when it produces these object files. Firstly, it needs to pre-process our code, which means that any pre-processor statements get evaluated then and there. Once our code has been pre-processed, we move on to more or less tokenizing and parsing and basically sorting out this English C++ language into a format that the compiler can actually understand and reason with. This basically results in something called an abstract syntax tree being created, which is basically a representation of our code but as an abstract syntax tree. The compiler's job at the end of the day is to convert all of our code into either constant data or instructions. Once the compiler has created this abstract syntax tree, it can begin actually generating code. Now this code is going to be the actual machine code that our CPU will execute. We also wind up with various other data, such as a place to store all of our constant variables. And that's essentially all the compiler does. It's not crazy complicated. It of course does get very complicated as your actual code complexity grows, but that is the gist of it. That's all that it does. We're gonna go ahead and jump into this and take a look at what each stage actually does so that you guys can see how it all works. So let's go. Okay, so here we've got a simple hello world application. You might remember this from the how C++ works video that I recently made. We basically just got this main function which calls log, which is actually defined inside this log.cpp file. And it simply just prints our message to the screen and we wind up with a simple application which says hello world. If we pop over into our output directory into debug here, you can see that it's generated a hello world.exe file. And then back in the project directory in debug, it's generated a main.obj and log.obj file. So what the compiler has done is it's generated object files for each of our C++ files, for each of our translation units. Now every CPP file that our project contains that we actually tell the compiler, hey, compile this CPP file, every single one of those files will result in an object file. These CPP files are things called translation units, essentially. You have to realize that C++ doesn't care about files. Files are not something that exists in C++. For example, in Java, your class name has to be tied to your file name and your folder hierarchy has to be tied to your package. And there's all of this going on because Java expects certain files to exist. In C++, that is not the case. There is no such thing as a file. A file is just a way to feed the compiler with with source code. You're responsible for telling the compiler what kind of file type this is and how the compiler should treat that. Now, of course, if you create a file with the extension .cpp, the compiler is going to treat that as a C++ file. Similarly, if I make a file with the extension .c or .h, the compiler is gonna treat the .c file like a C file and not a C++ file and it's gonna treat the .h file like a header file. These are basically just default conventions that are in place. You can override any of them, and that's just how the compiler will, will deal with it if you don't tell it how to deal with it. I could go around making .cherno files and telling the compiler to compile that, and that would be totally fine, as long as I tell the compiler, hey, this file is a C++ file, please compile it like a C++ file. So just remember, files have no meaning, okay? Remember that, it's important. So that being said, every C++ file that we feed into the compiler and we tell it this is a C++ file, please compile it, it will compile it as a translation unit. And a translation unit will result in an object file. It's actually quite common to sometimes include CPP files in other CPP files and create basically one big CPP file with a lot of files in it. If you do something like that and then you only compile the one CPP file, you're going to basically result in one translation unit and 
thus one object file. So that's why there's that terminology split between what a translation unit is and what a CPP file actually is, because a CPP file doesn't necessarily have to equal a translation unit. However, if you just make a project with individual CPP files and you never include them in each other, then yes, every CPP file will be a translation unit and every CPP file will generate an object file. Now, these are actually pretty big. You can see this one's 30 kilobytes and this one's 46 kilobytes. The reason for that is because we're including IO stream and that has a lot of stuff in it. So that's why they're so big. And because of that, they're actually pretty complicated. So before we dive in and take a look at what's actually in the files, let's create something a little bit more simple. I'm gonna right click on source file, hit add new item. It, this is going to be a C++ file. I'm gonna call it math cpp and hit add. Over here I'm just going to write a very basic multiply function which multiplies two numbers together. I'm not going to include any files in here or anything. I'm just going to write a very simple function. It's going to return an integer. It's going to be called multiply. It's going to take two parameters int a and int b. It's then going to create a result variable which stores the result of a times b and then we're going to return that result variable. Nice and simple. That's it. Let's hit control 7 to build that file. You can see over here that it's built it successfully. I'm actually going to just resize Visual Studio a little bit just to make it easier. So now you can see the output window a bit better. If we look back into our output directory, you can see that we've got this math.obj file now and it's four kilobytes. Before we take a look at what exactly is in that object file, let's talk about the first stage of compilation, which I mentioned earlier pre-processing. During the pre-processing stage, the compiler will basically just go through all of our pre-processing statements and evaluate them. The ones that we commonly use are include, define, if, and ifdef. There are also pragma statements which tell the compiler exactly what to do, but we'll talk about them in another video. So let's take a look at one of the most common pre-processor statements that we have, hash include. How does that work? So hash include is actually really simple. You basically specify which file you want to include, and then the preprocessor will open that file, read all of its contents, and just paste it into the file where you wrote your include statement. And that's it. It's really, really simple, and I'm about to prove that. So back over here, I'm just going to make a header file. I'm gonna right click on header files, hit add, new item. This is gonna be a header file, and I'm gonna call it end brace, and then click add. Okay, we're gonna wipe out whatever was in this file and I'm just going to type in a closing curly brace. That is it. That's our entire file. So now back in math.cpp, you can see that we've reasonably written a closing curly bracket here for our multiply function. Let's go ahead and wipe that out. If we compile our file now by hitting Control F7, you can see that the compiler complains about the left brace being unmatched at the end of the file. So instead of fixing this like a normal person and just adding in our ending brace, Let's go ahead and include our end brace header file. So I'll type in hash include end brace. And there we go. Let's hit control F7 to compile that. And look, it compiled successfully. Of course it did, because all the compiler did was open this end brace file, copy whatever was in here, and then just paste it into here. And that is it. Okay, header files solved. You should now know exactly how they work and how you can use them. There's actually a way we can tell the compiler to output a file which contains the result of all of these preprocessor evaluations that have happened. If we bring back our include and brace and then right click on our hello world project and hit properties, under C, C++ and then preprocessor, I'm going to set the preprocess to a file to yes. Make sure that you're editing your current configuration and platform so that these settings actually apply. Let's hit okay and then we're going to just hit control F7 to build this again. If we bring up our output directory, you'll see this new .i file, which is our preprocessed C++ code. Let's open this in a text editor so that we can look at it. Okay, so here you can see what the preprocessor has actually generated. You can see that our source code had this include end brace, and yet the preprocessor code has just inserted our end brace that was in that .h file that we've included. Pretty simple stuff. Let's add some more preprocessor statements and see what it does. So back in our file, I'm going to restore our end brace because I'm getting tired of looking at that include. I'm then going to come up here and define something. I'm going to define the word integer to be int. Now don't ask me why I would ever do this. This is just an example. The define preprocessor statement will basically just do a search for this word and replace it with whatever follows. So let's replace our int here with the word integer so that we actually return this integer. We can also do the same here. Let's hit control F7. And if we look back at our file, you can see what's happened. It just looks normal, int result. If we were to do something stupid here, like write the word cherno and then hit control F7, if we go back to our file, you can see it now says cherno multiply and cherno result. Pretty cool stuff. Let's play around with this a little bit more. Let's bring back our int. 
we'll get rid of this define. And instead what I'm going to do is actually just use something called if. The if preprocessor statement can let us include or exclude code based on a given condition. So over here, I'm just going to write if one, which in other words means true, and then just write an end if at the end of this function. I'll hit control F7. We'll go back to our preprocessor file and you can see that it looks exactly like it does here without the if statement. If I go back here and I switch this off by writing if zero, Visual Studio will fade out our code to show that it's disabled. If I hit control F7 and take a look at this file, we have no code. So that's another great example of a preprocessor statement. All right, one more, we'll look at include. So let's get rid of our if zero. And then I'm going to write include IO stream, the massive, massive IO stream. Let's hit control F7. Let's look back at this. And whoa, take a look at this. We have in here 50,623 lines. And there's our function at the very bottom. And then look, this is all that include IO stream has done. Now, of course, IO stream also includes other files. So it's kind of like rolling a snowball down a hill. You can now hopefully see why those object files were so big because they included IO stream and that is a lot of code. All right, great. So that's the preprocessor. Once that stage has done, we can move on to actually compiling our C++ code into machine code. If we go back to our project here, I'm going to get rid of this include because we don't need it. And then I'm just going to hit control F7. You should now see in our preprocessor file that we're back to normal. And in fact, I'm actually going to go into hello world hit properties and then disable that preprocess to a file. If you actually read what preprocess to a file does, you'll see that it actually does not produce an OBJ file. So we need to disable it so that we can actually build our project. Let's hit okay. And then we'll hit control F7 to build our CPP file. You'll see that we should now get a math.obj file, which is actually up to date. So let's take a look at what's actually inside our OBJ file. If we open this file with a text editor, you'll see that it's binary, which doesn't really help us too much. But part of what is actually inside here is the machine code that our CPU will run when we call this multiply function. So because this is just binary and completely unreadable, let's convert it into a form that might actually be more readable by us. There are several ways we could do this, but I'm just gonna use Visual Studio. I'll right click on Hello World and hit Properties. Under C, C++ and then Output Files, I'm going to set Assembler Output to be set to Assembly Only Listing. I'm then gonna hit OK and we're gonna hit Control F7. Inside our output directory, you should see a math.asm file. Let's go ahead and open that with a text editor. Okay, so this is basically a readable result of what that object file actually contains. If we go down over here, you'll see that we actually have this function called multiply, and then we have a bunch of assembly instructions. These are the actual instructions that our CPU will execute when we run the function. I'm not gonna go into huge detail about all of this assembly code now, I might save that for another video. But if we take a look over here, you'll see that our multiplication operation actually happens here. Basically, we load the A variable into our EAX register, and then we perform an IML instruction, which is a multiplication instruction on the B variable and that A variable. We're then storing the result of that in a variable called result and then moving it back into EAX to return it. The reason this kind of double move happens is because I actually made a variable called result and then returned it instead of just returning A times B. That's why we get this moving EAX into result and then moving result into EAX which is completely redundant. This is another great example of why if you set your compiler not to optimize, you're gonna wind up with slow code because it's doing extra stuff like this for no reason. If I go back to my code and I actually get rid of that result variable by just returning A times B and then compile this, you'll see the assembly looks slightly different because we're just doing IMUL on B and EAX and then that's it. EAX is actually going to contain our return value. Now, all of this may look like a lot of code and that's because we're actually compiling in debug which doesn't do any optimization and does extra things to make sure that our code is as verbose as possible and as easy to debug as possible. If we go back into our project and right click here, hit properties, I'm going to go over here into optimization under the debug configuration. Let's select maximize speed. If you try and compile this now, it'll actually give you an error because you'll see that O2 and RTC is actually incompatible. So we'll have to go back over here into code generation and make sure that our basic runtime checks are set to default, which basically won't perform runtime checks. This is basically just code that the compiler will insert to help us with debugging. Let's hit control F7 and look at that assembly file again. Wow. That looks a lot smaller. We've basically just got our variables being loaded into a register and then the multiplication and then that's it. Pretty simple stuff. You should now have a basic idea of what the compiler actually does when you tell it to optimize. It optimizes. 
This is a pretty simple example, so let's take a look at something a bit more advanced. We'll take a look at a slightly different example, in which case we don't actually take anything in here, but I decide to do something like five times two. We'll save that file, I'll go into my properties and make sure that I disable optimization. So let's hit Control F7 and take a look at our file. You can see that what it's done is actually really simple. It's simply moved 10 into our EAX register, which is the register that will actually store our return value in. So if we take a look at our code again, it's basically just simplified our five times two to be 10. Because of course there's no need to do something like five times two to constant values at runtime. This is something called constant folding, where anything that is constant that can be worked out at compile time is. Let's make things more interesting by involving another function. So for example, I'm actually going to write a log function, which is going to log a certain message. Of course, I don't actually want to make it log anything because that would mean I would have to include IO stream, which will drastically complicate this. So I'm just going to get it to return that message that it receives. Over here in multiply, I'm going to call log with the word multiply. I want to change this back to be A and B, and we'll return A times B. Let's hit Control F7. All right, so let's take a look at what our compiler has generated. If we scroll down a bit, you'll see that we've got this log function, which doesn't really do much, but this actually will just return our message. You can see that it's moving our message pointer into EAX, which is our return register, as we've established. So this is the log function. If we scroll up a little bit, you'll see the multiply function. And then all we have here is a call to log. So right before we actually do our multiplication by using the iMul, we actually call this log function. Now you might be wondering why this log function is decorated by what seems like random characters and at signs. This is actually the function signature. This needs to uniquely define your function. We'll talk more about this in the linking video, but essentially when we have multiple OBJs and our functions are defined in multiple OBJs, it's going to be the linker's job to link all of them together. And the way that it's gonna do that is it's going to look up this function signature. So all you need to know here is that we're calling this log function. That's what the compiler will actually do when you call a function. It will generate a call instruction. Now in this case, it might be a little bit stupid because you can see that we're simply calling log, we're not even storing the return value. Basically, this could be optimized quite a bit. If we go back here and we turn on optimization to maximize speed and hit Control F7, you'll actually see that that just disappears entirely. Yep, the compiler just decided that does nothing, I'm going to remove that code. But you should basically now understand the gist of how the compiler works. It will take our source files and output an object file which contains machine code and any other constant data that we've defined. That's basically it. And now that we've got these object files, we can link them into one executable which contains all of the machine code that we actually need to run. And that's how we make a program in C++. Pretty simple. Make sure that you check out my video on how the link works so that you can see the next step. But apart from that, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something new. You should now have a basic understanding of what the C++ compiler actually does. And that's gonna be really important when it comes to debugging and also when we get into more advanced topics in the future. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you really like this, you can support me on Patreon. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Vroom.